of when you think poverty? Does it look like this? Or maybe it looks like this? Or even like this? Well, these are definitely stereotypes, but you wouldn't be alone in thinking that. These are just a few of the first images that pop up with a simple Google Images search of poverty. These, these images are examples of what extreme poverty can look like, but it is not a truly comprehensive view of what poverty actually looks like for millions of people globally. In the U.S. alone, 37.9 million people fall below the poverty threshold as measured by the official poverty measure, an absolute poverty measure. But what does this really mean? Does every poverty situation look like the stereotypes we saw earlier? Do we even know what poverty really is? In order to propose functioning solutions to poverty, including situations like those we just showed and other situations, we must first understand who is affected by it and how we can measure it. The goal of this presentation is to share how poverty should be defined and measured in a way that upholds people's inherent dignity. Robert Rector introduces the point that the standard of, of living looks much different today than it did in the past, as the average poor American household has greatly improved recently in terms of amenities and utilities. However, Rector ignores the fact that poverty re reaches deeper than appliances and amenities. Rector's argument does not acknowledge the fact that these amenities could have come from a number of sources and that a person's decision to spend a relatively small amount on climate control or entertainment should not discredit the fact that they may be otherwise poor or even in poverty. Though we find Rector's argument to have some clear issues, we agree on the fact that those in poverty deserve our special attention in terms of allocation of time and resources. Though our consideration both of the implication of Rector's argument and the facts that he overlooks, we gained understanding of where the threshold of poverty is set can have life-changing effects on those at and around the threshold. If the threshold is set relatively high, those right underneath may suddenly receive benefits, but some people in great need may be disadvantaged if there is a higher competition for block grants, for example. On the other hand, if the threshold is set relatively low, many people who are truly lacking in terms of monetary or capability measures may be ignored. Though the poverty threshold is certainly contestable, its placement affects real people, and this is something that we must keep at the front of every discussion on this topic in order to uphold the di dignity of those in poverty. A person below the poverty threshold does not have sufficient resources or combined capabilities to uphold a minimally decent quality of life. Therefore, the MPI should be used to measure poverty in order to maintain dignity by considering aspects beyond the monetary dimension. Combined capabilities are the possible choices that one can make based on their internal motivations and external factors, such as politics or financial situations. Many current definitions of poverty use income lowness as the determining factor. For example, the OPM, which we discussed earlier, is used by the U.S. government to measure poverty, using the threshold of the price of three economy food baskets based from the 1960s, also adjusted for inflation. Though we recognize that money is important in maintaining a certain quality of life, it is the resources and opportunities that it provides that plays the most important role in one's well-being. By focusing on these elements rather than money, we are able to see the full scope of qualities that determines whether or not a person is in poverty. Interconnected, more resources typically leads to more capabilities, and when essential resources are unavailable to people, their capabilities become limited. This second circumstance is a representation of poverty if these unattainable combined capabilities prevent one from reaching a decent quality of life. Martha Nussbaum created a list of 10 combined central capabilities that she believes necessary for a sufficiently dignified life. These capabilities are centered in the American culture, creating a concern that it imposes cultural values on all people. However, these listed capabilities are not restrictive, but rather state that people should have the substantial freedom to live out these capabilities, turn them into functionings, if they so desire. It is important to acknowledge that part of upholding a person's dignity is allowing them to not take advantage of a, these capabilities or adapting them to fit their values as needed. We will elaborate on two that we perceive to be the most important, while also acknowledging that all of these capabilities are necessary to living a sufficiently dignified life. It is also possible that there are other necessary capabilities that have not been defined by this list. The combined central capability of control over one's environment refers to the ability to have a say in the political and physical means that affects one's life. This includes influencing the policies and laws that affects one's life as well as having privacy, owning personal items, and maintaining one's property. One's dignity would not be respected if they were unable to fulfill these capabilities to a certain threshold. Let's look at an example. 
This woman works long hours at her job on election day. She has a car with her at work and is able to take an hour break during her work day to drive to the ballots and cast her vote. This is a capability because her internal desire matches her external factors, such as transportation and a break in the workday. This also allows her to gain a political control over her environment. Now imagine that the same woman who has long work hours is not granted an hour break to vote. Even though she has a means of transport, her inability to leave work prevents her from being able to vote. This means that she does not have the capability to vote because an external factor is preventing her from completing this action. By preventing her from voting, she's losing the ability to control her own environment politically, which could disrespect her dignity, especially since she would have been voting on something that could have affected her own life. People who are experiencing poverty may be in a similar situation. The need for money and maintaining a job becomes a conflicting external conflict and factor that outweighs the ability to fulfill capabilities that exist on Nussbaum's list. Bodily health is another example of a combined central capability. This refers to the right to have sufficient health, food, and shelter. The goal of this capability is to ensure that money is not an external factor preventing one from obtaining sufficient health. One who is in poverty may not be able to afford health care, medicines, nutritional food, clean drinking water, or adequate housing, which would negatively impact one's quality of life. If we are able to recognize those who do not have these resources and are unable to maintain sufficient bodily health, we would be able to measure poverty in a more realistic manner. Once we have established how poverty should be defined, we can move on to describing how poverty should be measured. In our thesis, we mentioned the MPI as the main indicator that should be used to measure poverty, but it is also important to understand the MPI in context of its predecessor, the HDI. Both of these are poverty or development measures established by the UN that acknowledge the importance of capabilities such as education, bodily health, and standard of living. They were developed with the intention of taking the main focus of measuring poverty away from purely monetary indicators and shifting the focus towards the capability indicators. However, the two have considerable differences. The Multidimensional Poverty Imp Index, or the MPI, is the indicator that provides the best comprehensive idea of how individual households are doing. The UN describes the MPI as a key, as quote, a key international resource that measures acute multi multidimensional poverty across more than 100 developing countries. Though painted here in a positive light, this highlights the fact that only 100 countries are currently measured by the MPI, indicating that this measure cannot be applied on a large scale. Rather than focusing on indicators that examine the entire state of the country, it considers factors that might greatly vary on household to household basis, including nutrition, child mortality, number of years in school, school attendance, and various aspects of housing amenities and utilities. This is the information that the UN has published about how they consider each indicator. Even though micro data can tell us a lot about the specifics of a household situation, aggregate data can tell a lot about the quality of resources that the same household has access to. For example, you might assume that a household in which every member has, a, has had 100% school attendance for 12 years is adequately educated. The MPI would agree with you, counting this household's education dimension as sufficient. However, this fails to consider the quality of education available in the area, which would not be measured by the MPI since we are only looking at the individual level. Over, the overall state of the country this person lives in can allow us to infer more about the quality of education the child actually received. The HGI uses aggregate indicators to measure the state of an entire country by considering life expectancy index, education index, and the GNI index. These dimension indices can provide an, an idea of how the country a person is living in is doing. You might initially think, why would it matter how a person's area is doing? Why wouldn't we just want to measure how that person is doing? The most simple answer is that poverty does not happen in a vacuum. A very monetarily well-off family could live in an area where, because of the overall poverty of the area, their capabilities are severely limited. Aggregate data can tell a lot about the quality of resources that a person has access to. This is a proposed adjustment to the MPI that takes consideration of the quality of public resources via the HDI. The, a potential example of how this indicator could be measured is by increasing a country's measurement on the index if they had an HDI. DI below 0 0.732. 0 0.732 is the world HGI when considering the life expectancy index, the education index, and the GNI index on a global scale. This number and indicator was chosen for the purpose of it, purposes of illustrating this idea, but further research and consideration would be necessary to solidify this indicator and specific number. If we focus on the combined capabilities and the resources of a person as well as taking a modified approach to the MPI, we would better understand poverty and the extent to which it exists in our society today. Thank you.